Jesus' name, amen. I will just say too, this is the first Mother's Day I get to spend with my mom in about 24 years. So I told her to come to second service so she wouldn't meet any of you guys, I guess. But uh, <laughs> stories inbound if you find them between services. I've been told I look like my dad. So go find him. All right, the letters of the church have come to an end, and now we are invited uh, with John into heaven. If you're visiting us, we are going through the book of Revelation, because why not? Chapters four and five, though, might be, I, I think they are, my two favorite chapters in the Bible. Now, usually when I preach in every single book, I'll say, this is my favorite chapter, but no, no. This is, if I'm allowed to say there are things that I am more drawn to in other places in Scripture, chapters 4 and 5 are my favorite two chapters. I'm often reminded by uh, a line from Annie Dillard. I've said this one many times, but it's worth repeating about every three months. I'm a pastor. Why do people in church seem like cheerful, brainless tourists on a package, of the, on a package tour of the absolute? Does anyone have the foggiest idea, the sort of power we invoke? Or do I suspect none of us believe a word of it? The churches are like children playing on the floor with chemistry sets, mixing up batches of TNT to kill on Sunday morning. It's madness to wear hats, straw hats to church. We should be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should be issuing life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews for the sleeping God may wake up one day and take offense or the waking God may draw us to where we can never return. Sometimes when we're singing, I catch myself. Do, am I hearing myself? Do you hear what we're talking about? Do you know why we're gathered here? We are such half-hearted half -hearted creatures, right? And chapters four and five, we are now invited into where God dwells the very throne room of God. We are to try to close our eyes and as we hear the scripture read, which sometimes I just read Revelation four and five and I just go to the end, we don't need to say anything, and just close our eyes and feel it and picture it. You know, this week I was reading a book called Liturgy of the Ordinary. I'm sure some of you have read it. And the author writes this, I spent a few years in a war-torn area of the world and was a surprise that in the midst of all the danger I experienced, I felt more at peace there than in my average American day with a baby and toddler. I had a theology of suffering that allowed me to pay attention to crisis, but my theology was too big to touch the typical day of my life. I developed a habit of ignoring God in the daily grind. Every dayness is my problem. The scene of Revelation 4 isn't for this massive event of suffering in your future or something you're struggling in some massive way right now, this event is for the grind. This is for daily life struggles. This is a place where all of that is overwhelmed. And so we're just gonna get our eyes off ourselves and up into the throne room. And as we go into heaven, let me just call out one thing, verse one, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. What does after this mean? It's identical to chapter one, verse 19. What takes place after this? It occurs five more times in the book of Revelation. What must take place after this? It's identical to Daniel chapter two, verse 45. What must take place after this? So the question you get a lot in the book of Revelation is, especially coming out of chapter two or three, where it's like the safe zone, the place where all sermon series end. You just don't go into chapter four unless you're you're nervous, unless you're you know, a masochist like myself, and we're just gonna talk about it. So people ask this question, Revelation, when is this going to happen? This will take place after this. Is all of Revelation something in the future? And I'm at, we're, we'll talk about this as we go through the book, but at least here, the answer seems to be not everything. Revelation four is something that happens in the moment. Revelation five is something that has past realities. In Daniel chapter two, Daniel speaks about the coming of the kingdom of God. Well, when did that come? That came when Jesus came. And so the book of Revelation seems to be about the time when Jesus left until the time he comes back. And so as you read Revelation, what do you get? You get some things have happened in the book of Revelation. Some things are happening 
to the people in the book of Revelation that John is writing to. And yes, there are things in the future in the book of Revelation. It's a mixed bag. And even if you, and many Christians do this, they read it as a future manual of the future. And and that's great. It's It's a fair interpretation, but it only has to be future to the people who actually got the book. It doesn't have to be future to us. All right. That's the excursus. Now into heaven. Here we go. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Who is that speaking? Well, in chapter 1, Jesus appears to John, and he appears as someone who speaks like a trumpet. And here's what it says in Revelation chapter 1. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard a voice like a trumpet behind me. And then, this is what he looks like. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven lampstands. And among the lampstands, there was a son of man dressed in a robe, reaching, from he- reaching down to his feet and a golden sash from his chest. The hair on his head was, was as white as wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like a bronze glowing in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of rushing water. Coming out of his mouth was a sharp two-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. And so that person who has been speaking for chapters two and three and whom John fell down and worshiped in chapter one now tells John, come up here, John, and I will show you what must take place After this. Now, I want you, by the end of today, I I just want these two chapters to shape your life more than any of the chapters in the book of Revelation. When I taught the Bible uh, to students, I made them memorize this. And I even offered them a grade, an entire grade bump if they got the whole thing. And even 20 years later now, they still recite it to me. Man, I've been teaching a long time. Uh, They still recite it to me 10 years later, 15 years later, 20 years later. The rest of the book is going to be heavily symbolic. And it's going to be challenging at times. But the reason we need symbols is because there are things that we just cannot say with our words. Just imagine for a second, you're a missionary in the Amazon and they don't have a written language, you've never heard the language, so you're learning the language, and you now have to describe a car, uh, airplane, electricity, Amazon, uh, <laughs> packages, <laughs> delivery systems, mail, insulation, snow. How are you gonna do that? There are no words in their language. They have no point of reference to it. And so you're going to use symbols. That's what apocalypse is. Apocalypse is revelation, revealing, unveiling things. You are, John is trying to reveal things about God that we could not describe if we just use regular words. And so first, the one on the throne, verse two and three and verse five. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald was around the throne. Then verse five, from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder. In front of the throne were seven lamps that were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. This is a scene of the Trinity. You have the son of God who has called John up into heaven. And then you have the spirit, verse five. Now, this is from Zechariah 4. In Zechariah 4, there's a lamp, and then there are seven, uh, or it's a lamppost, and then there's seven lamps out of it, and they're, they're all burning. This is mentioned in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. Remember, seven is the perfect number. And so when you see seven spirits, it's most likely the seven spirits as in the Holy Spirit. Now, some people take that to be angelic beings, and people I love take that as angelic beings, but you have an emphasis on here on the presence of God and who God is. It would make more sense in my mind that this is the spirit. And now you have someone sitting on the throne. So you have the son, you have the spirit, and then he looks at the throne. Now, the word throne appears 38 times in the book of Revelation. 17 of them are in these two chapters. 
It's sort of important. Chapters two and three, you've got suffering, you've got pain, you've got, you need to overcome. And so what do they need to know? They need to know there's a throne and someone sits on it. There's a throne and someone rules on it. And this throne is overwhelming to John. Let's go through each one, verse three. It's shown like jasper and ruby. Now the, that, those are the two, uh, uh, what are they? Two stones that are on the high priest's uh, garb <laughs> that, he, that he would wear. So a jasper though is, is not what John sees. John sees, what does that text say? The likeness of a jasper, the appearance of a jasper and a ruby. Some of your translations will say carnelian. I, I remember going to London and going down to see the crown jewels. Um, and you, you go through a line that's way too long for this. And then you get, on an eleva- you get on a moving walkway that you're not allowed to move on, but it moves you. And you go into this super dark place. And all of a sudden there's these, these rooms with controlled light and there they are, crown jewels. And me being me, I just started doing this back and forth. And what happened? The light began to shoot this way and 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 this way. And then I got really into it. And then it was shooting this way and this way. And then my kids were like, stop, dad. Just one in particular told me to stop. But this is not a throne room with controlled light. This is a throne room where light is exploding. And he's looking and he's like, there's someone up there. And out of that, it's like, uh, it's like a jasper. It's like, it's like a ruby. Now, something happens interesting in the book of Revelation as you read it. So you go through the book of Revelation, then down comes heaven. And in chapter 21, it says this. He carried me away in the spirit to a mountain high, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven of God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel. Guess what? A jasper, clear as crystal. What is that? That means that the scene in chapter 4, as he's looking at the throne room of God, And then the scene in chapter 21, where heaven is coming down on the earth, is the same place. It's the place where God dwells. That's heaven. Then there's a rainbow. It looks like an emerald. We know in scripture from Noah, what what do rainbows represent? Mercy and judgment. It comes out of Ezekiel chapter one as well. Let me read you Ezekiel. Then I came and there was a voice of vault over the heads as they stood and lowered their wings. Those are angels. And above the vault over their heads, there was a throne like lapis lazuli. And high above the throne was a figure like a man. And I saw what appeared to be from the waist up looked like glowing metal full of fire. And what looked like from down was full of fi- looked like fire. And brilliant light surrounded him. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell face down and I heard the voice of one speaking. Ezekiel is the same thing. But notice what Ezekiel says. How does Ezekiel describe looking at God? This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. He couldn't do it. There were not words to describe it. How do you describe God? You can't. Back to Revelation, verse five. From the throne came flashes of lightnings, rumblings and peals of thunder. Now, there is no storm. There are no clouds. There is no darkness. There's just light. And from the light comes flashes of lightnings, rumblings and peals of thunder. Now, I don't... I don't know how much we uh, appreciate the fear of a thunderstorm. Maybe some of you have been caught in one up in the mountains. You get, you get up high and then you don't know it's coming and then here it comes. But I'll be honest with you, Montana does not have thunderstorms. It has windstorms with some thunder. To get a proper Midwest thunderstorm and to be stuck in it is totally different. I, I remember one time in 2000. 2007, Amy had taken our newborn uh, to New York, and I came out of a movie theater, and this, it was like blackness had descended, and I get in our town and country minivan with 180,000 miles on it as it shakes down the road, 
and the car is shaking because of the thunder. I call Amy to say goodbye. I, I, I remember calling her and saying, if I die, I love you. Take care of McKenna. I don't know if I'm going to make it. And, I'm, and, and darkness just descends. And, and like this two-mile stretch on 169 in, the, in, nor, in northern Minneapolis, I thought I was going to die. And here is John without any protection seeing that. There's all the light. There's the jasper. He's moving his head back and forth. Thunder, lightning, rainbow, no darkness. Someone's on the throne. That's what he's looking at. Part two, those who surround the throne. So John describes the throne. There's, there's Jesus who's pulled him up into this. There's the spirit. There's the throne. There's the rainbow. There's the brilliance. There's the thunder. There's the lightning. There, there's overwhelming uh, the census event. And then you find in concentric circles uh, people around the throne or things. Are, so here's the first one. Surrounding the throne, verse, in chapter four, there were 24 other thrones. So that you have the throne and then around it, 24 other thrones and on them were 24 elders. Now there is a lot of discussion about who these elders are. And if I'm right, I'm about to ruin one of my favorite songs. Um, some people say this represents the church. You know, this is the, and the people of God. This is the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles and they, they represent essentially the people of God. The problem with that, it's based on a bad translation of, of chapter 5, verse 9. Here's the, here's the verse. They sang a new song. This is the elders. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God per persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation. Older translations had that you purchased us. And if it's us, then these are saints because angels don't have a redeemer. But... It seems that these are angels. Here's why. Number one, angels functioned as people who explain things in the book of Revelation. And in chapter five, they're gonna, these elders are going to explain stuff. Number two, in chapter five, verse eight, they take the prayers of the saints and offer them to God. Here's verse eight. When he had taken it, the four living creatures, the 24 elders fell down at the lamb, each one with a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which is the prayers of God's people. So, they don't seem to be God's people. They seem to be angels that offer up things to, to God. In chapter 14, verse 3, Christians are singing a new song, and that new song cannot be sung by the elders. Here's 14, verse 3. They sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. See how they're different? No one could learn the song except the 144,000, leave that for now, who had been redeemed from the earth. And then in chapter 5, and we've noticed this already, the elders are different from the saints. Now, how does that ruin my favorite hymn? Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns across the glassy sea. What's that song about? Revelation 4. Are the saints casting down their crowns? They are not. Shoot. I still sing it, <laughs> uh, not just because it sounds good, because, I mean, in a sense, yes, why not? We could join in on laying down our crowns, maybe in chapter five, but the imagery is wrong. It's not true. These are angels, not saints. In fact, if Jesus gave crowns to his people, it'd be kind of weird for us to give them back, as if to say, no, no, they're yours. I mean, Jesus gave them to us. It's like when someone gives you a gift and you say, no, I'm giving it back to you to honor you. That doesn't make any sense. All right. In front of the throne, there was what looked like, sorry to ruin that for you, what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. So now there's a sea. So now you've got the, the elders around the throne and you've got a sea that separates John from God. Now in Revelation and in Daniel, the sea represents one thing, evil. It's where the beast comes out of. It's where chaos is. And if you just read cosmic mythology, where is the place where evil arises out of? It's out of the sea. I mean, the Jews are not seafaring people, okay? They don't have GPS. The sea is not a good place. And even if you were a seafaring people, the sea is not an easy place to navigate. 
And so you get to Revelation 21, 1, and one of the things about heaven is there is no sea. Now, I've, I read a book on heaven by someone that I love, and in the book, she says, uh, John Erickson Tata says, I'm so bummed there's no sea in heaven uh, because it says there's no sea in heaven. Well, that's wrong. It's there is no evil in heaven. Everyone who loves walks on the beach. They're still going to happen. Promise. In the throne room, the sea is calm. It's a sea of glass. That is, it's, it's clear as crystal. In other words, all evil in the presence of God is quiet in God's presence. It's silent in God's presence. Maybe you know what it's like to be out on water when it's not calm. One of the scariest experiences of my life was being on a catamaran that couldn't turn around in the Chesapeake Bay. I thought I was going to lose my life. And that was with a skilled person. I remember my first, almost first date with Amy. I told her I could sail. I could not. <laughs> and uh, five mile an hour wind on a lake in New York. And within two minutes, we were capsized. Listen, some of you have been up in the high mountain lakes when there is no wind for 30 seconds. You know, what, what, what are those lakes like? Clear as glass, clear as crystal, completely calm. And the image is, in God's presence, evil is stilled. When Jesus is on the boat with his disciples, what does he say to the water? Stop it. Not quite, but stop it. And what happens to the water? Totally silent. That's the point. And if that's not enough, now there are terrifying creatures. Verse 6. In the center around the throne, there were four living creatures. They were covered with eyes. Don't draw this. In front and in back, the four living creatures was like a lion, the second like an ox, the third the face of a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings that covered all their eyes around them, even under their wings. What in the world is that? Now, this is from Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10. In Ezekiel 1, they look like humans. They have four faces, they legs of cat, cat, like calf hoods, they, calves hooves, they, they have gleaming bronze legs, and each side is a human being, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. Here it is out of Ezekiel. Their faces looked like this, verse, chapter 1, verse 10. Each of the four had a face of a human being. On the right side, they had the face of a lion. The left, an ox. Each had the face of an eagle. So there it is again. Human, lion, ox, eagle. What, what are they doing and who are they? It seems that these living creatures probably represent all of the created orders. So you have the lion, the king of all wild beasts. You have the ox, the king and the strongest of all domesticated animals. You have the eagle, the, the strongest of all uh, flying animals. I mean, listen, wh why do we have the eagle in the United States and Canada has the badger? Like, which one invokes fear? You see that? Like, eagles on, on purpose. And then the human, the head of all Creation. Now, this is from Isaiah 6, where they had wings to cover them. They, they covered their face in Isaiah 6. Not even angels could look at them. They had two wings to cover them in modesty and two wings to fly to execute God's judgment. You're not supposed to draw this. This is a, this is a symbolic language of trying to capture what it's like to be in God's presence with all the created order around him and the 24 elders around him and then the sea of glass around him. Now what? What do they do? Verse 8, they sing. Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. What's the natural heavenly response to being in God's presence? What is the thing that they do over and over and over again? They sing. You know, some people don't like repetitive songs uh, in churches. Listen, you're not going to like heaven if you don't like repetitive songs. This is a song that never ends. It just goes on and on, my friends. Holy, 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 over and over and over and over again. So John's looking out at this. You have intense glory shining around, lightning and thunder. You have the seven spirits of God. You've got the... You've got the 
the angelic beings that look crazy covering themselves. You have the 24 elders. You have the sea of glass. You, you've got Jasper and Carnelian coming out of the throne. You've got the son of God and who hasn't been mentioned uh, since the very beginning in, in chapter one, but he's standing next to him and they sing holy, holy, holy. You know, one way that's been used to describe God is like he's like the sun. He, he gives life. He uh, He uh, gives energy to things, but the closer you get to him, the more dangerous it is. But the thing is with God, his holiness is not dangerous because it's bad. His holiness is dangerous because it's good. And so when you read the Old Testament law, what what is most a lot of the Old Testament law about? It's about the purity laws in order to get close to this holy God. And in order to get close to this holy God who is not safe, certain things need to happen. And, you know, we balk at rules like that, right? Like it doesn't feel authentic. It's I, I need to come to God in my authentic way. And usually authenticity means on my terms. But the, but the Old Testament does not allow you to come to God on your terms. It literally creates a thousand barriers to get to the holiness of God. Given by God himself. Not by humans. These aren't human rules. These are God's rules so you don't die. He's not safe. That's why when Isaiah gets into the presence of God, he knows he's not safe and he completely gets undone. And then here comes the angel, puts a coal on his tongue and says, your sins have been atoned for. It made him pure. And then you get to the vision of Ezekiel in chapter 47. Here comes God and there's a temple and there's water coming out of the temple and it starts as a trickle, turns into a river. And what happens? All the desert is made alive. God's holiness comes out of the temple and brings life. And then here comes Jesus, the fulfillment of all these things. And what does he do? He goes around touching all these impure people who should not be able to get into God's presence. And Jesus transfers his holiness to them. You go be holy. I'm holy. And then Jesus tells his people that he is, that Jesus is the temple. He himself is the temple. He is the place where the holiness of God resides. And then he gives that, that presence to us and the people of God together are the temple. The whole, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit himself. And then here comes Peter. And what does he say? You be holy. And then you go to Revelation and here comes the temple out of the, out of the heavens. And there's a river coming out of it, making everything alive. Look, his holiness either kills you or heals you. Those are the only two options. Who is like God? Here's Ezekiel 36. Why is he doing all this? Say to the house of Israel, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I act. It's for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations. I will vindicate my holiness of my great name that you have profaned among the nations. The nations will know I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. When is that happening? Now. Now. as the gospel goes out and God's name is revered. So back to Revelation after we've toured scripture. This is Isaiah 6. Now he calls him Lord God Almighty. That's, that's the, the, the title for sovereignty. Who was and is and is to come. He is forever. And then all the living creatures and all the 24 elders on their throne, they all lay down their crowns before the glassy sea, not the saints. And they repeat, verse 9, the one who lives forever and ever. Verse 10, the one who lives forever and ever and ever. That is, this is an eternal being. He has been forever. He is worthy. The, the, the categories that have been, or the titles that were put on Jesus in chapter one are now put on the one on the throne in chapter four. He is worthy. Why? Because he is the sovereign creator, verse 11, over the entire universe. Everything that is created has their being from God. Man, atheists crack me up sometimes. It's like they're, they yell at God and they're breathing air. You, you have your being from God. And who are you yelling at if he doesn't exist? And so go through the scene. Will you join the song? That's what John is invited into. This is, we we offend God's holiness, okay? Sin is holiness not reverenced. This is not safe. You know, 
you ever hear Christian radio stations that they go safe for the whole family? I'm like, you haven't read parts of the Bible or and you're not gonna read them on your radio station. I, I know what they're getting at, but you know what I mean. One of my favorite stories from history is Thomas Aquinas, theologian, 13th century. He's 50, he's written prolifically, working on his magnum opus. I mean, this is the guy who wrote seven books at the same time and have a scribe and he would just bounce between books and have people writing them. And then in December 6th, 1273, he stopped writing because he had some sort of experience that he would not talk about other than to say this, I cannot write, everything I have written seems like straw to me compared to those things that I have seen and have been revealed to me. Some of us have had experiences with God like that. Not experiences with nature, not experiences with myself, not experiences in my, you know, just me and my, my room, but just so, something where God just crushes you. Just gives you like the, you know, like if God un, unrolls the earth and just kind of goes, hey, this is what the other dimension's like, he just kind of gives you a peek. And usually it's from reading scripture and something just gets you. And when that happens, it's just like everything else just stops, right? Like everything slows down where Revelation 4 is real. Like this is real, real. Now, what does this have to do with everyday life? I was reading a story of someone who lost their keys. Listen to these words. I'm going to summarize. I've lost my keys. Anyone else? And with that becomes a sense of all perspective. I'm suddenly imprisoned. So stage one, logic, I retrace my steps. This is like me living my life. I remain calm. I am rational. This is no big deal. Step two, self-condemnation. I'm such an idiot. Where are those keys? I'm such an idiot. I just, if I hurt myself enough, eventually they'll appear. Stage three, vexation. I am frustrated. Where did my kids who don't drive pick up my keys? And where did they take? Where did my spouse? She must have, or he must have picked up my keys. And I'm, I start looking for places that there's no way they're in because I haven't been there in years. Desperation. I'm, I'm upset. I'm grumbling. I'm mad. Now I'm in despair. I'm hopeless. Outside my window is my locked car and the sun is risen and there are sparrows in the air and the grass is growing and flowers are blooming, but stupid flowers and stupid life and stupid planet, stupid universe. And then I go back and I sit on the couch. I'm frustrated and I reach my hand down and there they are in my pocket. <laughs> and, and then I go found them just to myself because no one's there. And in that moment, you realize something as small as losing your keys can completely undo your day. Your idolatry of ease, your false hope for comfort, you just want things to run smoothly. It's, it's a revelation. It's your misplaced reliance on yourself. Everything should go according to plan. I'm responsible. You see how Revelation 4 can come into your attitude about lost keys and how quickly you lose perspective? Someone left out a dish. Someone forgot to brush their teeth. They didn't put their shoes on before they came to church. Why are you, why are we fighting in the car on the way here? Do you think Revelation 4 can handle that or can it only handle big, massive problems in your life? Revelation 4 is for this. It's for the grind. It's for you to get your eyes off yourself when you're changing diapers and you're making food for, you're making dinner that no one's gonna eat because they don't like what you make and messy rooms and bad breath, and everything else in between. It's for this. Je Jesus taught his disciples to pray, our Father in heaven, holy is your name. This is a dangerous God. He is not safe. I know many of you are wondering, am I gonna quote line, which in the wardrobe now, I am. <laughs> <laughs> this is the line, if you haven't read it, many people here have when Mrs. Beaver is talking to Lucy about Aslan, who is the Christ figure. Is he safe? I'm really rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, make no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. But if there is anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, you're either braver than most or just silly. 
Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe? Didn't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Let's not be a church of brainless, cheerful tourists on a package tour of the absolute. Let's be careful with our words. Let's, he has given us a way to approach him in his holiness and be healed. That's what the death of Christ offers you. He offers to touch you and make you holy. That's what Jesus does. So that when you come into the throne room, you're overwhelmed in your senses, but you're not overwhelmed because you're impure. You've been made pure by Christ. Amen. Amen. I love Revelation 4. Let's pray. Lord, may Revelation 4 be healing for everyone in this room. We get caught up in lots of things in our lives. We get caught up in arguments. We get caught up in arguments just so we have something to talk about. We get caught up in relationships that go great and not so great. We get caught up in dreams. We get caught up in just getting our family to church this morning, and we barely dragged ourselves in here. And into the mundane everydayness of life comes holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And all the living creatures coming down and worshiping him, worthy are you who was slain. Lord, we worship a lamb who was slain from the foundations of the earth for us, who made us holy by touching us and atoning our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and